Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hello and welcome to Asia Tech Podcast Stories. My name is Graham Brown. Today we're going to look at using technology to empower teachers working with children with social needs. We're going to look at social innovation, social entrepreneurship. Joined by a lady today whose work has taken her to a wide range of countries, including rural India, all the way from Singapore. It's Caroline Essain, founder and MD of Crate Cat. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's fantastic to have you here. We've got so much ground to cover today, Caroline. We're going to talk about social innovation, so social entrepreneurship, development, child development, using technology to empower people in different countries to work with children with social needs. First, before we go there, let's talk about what you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we can maybe backtrack a little bit about how you got into that space and how you've worked with accelerators such as Impact Tech, who were on the show the other day. Let's start with yourself, Caroline. What is it that you do? Well, I trained many, many years ago initially as um, an occupational therapist. And an occupational therapist is someone who um, works around what we call daily living skills. So we help um, anyone who maybe has a disability or a mental health problem or something that um, impacts on their ability to lead a, a, a meaningful life. I work now with children with special needs um, and social and emotional challenges. So anyone who either has a physical disability and isn't able to do things for themselves, people, uh, 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 children on the autistic spectrum, um, and I help them develop the skills they need to engage in learning and life. Basically, that's my background. I'm also an art therapist, um, and I do a lot of training around the importance of creativity in human development. Um, and uh, my master's is in play-based education. Mm. So I look at how play is important for the way children learn and the way that they're brains develop basically so i'm a trainer but i'm also a clinician right so you're effectively working with children who have special needs you mentioned for example uh, kids with autism as an example there um and we'll talk about the technology angle in a minute we're using technology to help the teachers and the mentors and the parents and the adults in that space as well now i imagine that you know people like yourself who are clinicians who spent many, many years building up your professional skills and your professional profile. It must be kind of rare for them then to go through something like an incubator, which we'll talk about in a minute. So I'm just imagining it's kind of a, a bit of, you know, it, an outlier in that space. I imagine a lot of people would have just continued doing what they were doing as clinicians working in that space but you've decided to go off and you've started your business and you've grown through this incubator and so on do you see yourself as a bit of an outline a bit of a maverick in that space or are there many other people like yourself doing what you're doing um i think i'm definitely a maverick i think um, sometimes i wake up in the morning and i think oh, why don't i just stick with the day job <laughs> i think uh, you, know, you get to a stage in your life where um you have a certain level of expertise and usually you write a book or right. you become a, a university lecturer and you pass it on that way. I think I was, I, I, I dream bigger than that. And mm. I realized that um, I was saying to um, Kinneray, who I know you were interviewing the other day, that I'm, I'm lucky now. I've been a clinician for over 30 years and I can see a child and I can know almost instantaneously because I have so much knowledge how I can help that child. And you realize you get to that level when you have this expertise. And what do you do with it? You, you write a book that only a few people read. Or can you do something a bit more exciting with it? And I think that's where I saw I wanted to harness the, the, the new things that are happening in technology. And I saw that actually I had expertise that was relevant to more people than I'm able to see face to face in my, my daily professional life. It's brave, isn't it? I mean, you, you said you had 30 years of practice history, training and so on, I, you know, to, to then step out of that comfort zone. And because you have this, I don't know if you're on a mission or what it, what it is that was driving you to do that. 
but I imagine a lot of people in that space wouldn't have done it because they would have feared losing all that experience and stepping out into a world where, you know, they're almost starting out again as new. I mean, how was that for you to go from being a clinician into, you know, going to an accelerator and so on? It's, it's been a massive learning curve. Um, it's taken me out of my comfort zone. Um, I'm surrounded by people, uh, particularly uh, because impact tech is about technology, a lot of technical people. Whereas I'm a people person, I'm a creative person, it wasn't really my space, but I realized if I was going to be able to have the kind of impact I want to have uh, in the special needs field, my passion is actually the developing world where there isn't a lot of expertise. And um, I mean, if you want, I can tell you the story, what actually inspired me to get involved Please. in this, because yeah. it goes back to one particular moment. Do, mm. do you want me to tell oh, it? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. We want to hear. Um, I've spent, I've been to many conferences over my life. And I was in one in India about um, 2013, and I was doing a training workshop about how I work with children and how I use play and creativity and how it makes a difference with, with children. And I'm based in Singapore, and I'm because I'm one of the most experienced clinicians, I'm quite an expensive clinician, and Singapore, by nature of being an expensive city, pushes your value up mm. in Asia. And I was talking about my work and afterwards lots of people came up to me and said, oh, come and train for me, come and train for me. Could you come and do this? And I knew realistically I didn't have the time to go to everyone who would have liked that expertise. Also, I know that a lot of the um, organizations that work with children with special needs in places like in India couldn't afford me. Um, and so that really, that planted the seed of thinking, um, how can I actually support these people who are doing an am amazing work? I mean, just for your information, there are 52 million children with special needs in India. Wow. 80% of those are below the poverty line. Mm. And of that 80%, 50% could have been prevented with the right early intervention. So, you know, you're looking at massive numbers. And I just thought, if I can see a child and in five minutes know what can help them, I've got that level of expertise, but how can we dissipate it fast? It would take me over a hundred lifetimes mm. to go around to each service and train up their staff to do what I'm able to train here in Singapore. And that I've spent the last 15 years building capacity in the services here. And so it was really sort of thinking, okay, there's this massive need. I've got the skills. What can we harness to build capacity? And technology seemed the obvious answer how is it obvious there because i imagine a lot of your skill like any body who's built up expertise over the years is sometimes i know you can train people but sometimes it's instinct isn't it you've seen patterns which have repeated over a number of years and you just instinctively know how what, what comes next what is the relevance of this situation or this child's case study and so on is it easily transferable is it just a case of right like building a teaching platform or you know uh, what what was the natural, the obvious steps for you to, as you say, dissipate your knowledge to a place like India? Well, I came up, I think it was about three, four months later, I came up with the idea. I, I actually have a partner in rural India, and I've been working with them for the last six years. And I go out and I do training and I work with the parents and I visit parents in their homes and try and give some support. So this is where I've tested it face to face. And I was about to do a training after I'd been at this conference and I came up with the idea, you know, let's use social media. Everyone's on YouTube. They're changing ideas. You, know, you have a sort of two or three minute YouTube and it makes you think something new. So if we want to be mind changers, let's use social media in that way and new media in that way. So I, I went up and I was developing this training course and I hired a filmmaker in rural in, uh, in India to come and film my training and film me working with the children so that I could put it online to inspire other people to um, try out some of these approaches and change the way that they were working with children. I'd never done anything like that before. Mm. I'd never worked with a filmmaker. Um, it, was, it was such fun and completely crazy. And luckily he really got what I wanted and right. did some amazing footage. 
And then it took me eight months with a filmmaker here in Singapore to cut it into a training course. Um, so it was the beginning of sort of blended learning, which is all the rage in universities now. But I felt I didn't, a lot of them are just lecturing with a PowerPoint. Mm. I wanted to show, I wanted to inspire people to, that you could do things often with children who people didn't have a clue what they were trying to communicate or what their needs were. And I've been very lucky that my uh, partners in rural India um, have allowed me to work and film with them and share examples. Because what gives, uh, you know, why films are so impactful is that they tell you a story and they show you things. Mm. I think that's fascinating. I'm curious to know who you're actually targeting with that. Would that be the the care workers? Would it be the parents? Because, you know, who has access to that? And who, I suppose, we'll come to the cultural aspects as well in a minute. But first of all, who are you targeting with your content? Um, the, what, when I go there and train face-to-face, and my courses are designed the same, I target parents, uh, teachers, and clinicians. Hmm. Um, and, and you try, I mean, what we often find, when I was looking at similar content that's been developed online, and I've done a few online courses, a lot of them come from the U.S. or the U.K., Mm-hmm. They're very, and this taps in a bit to the cultural thing, they're very Western bias. Um, and often they're in quite high professional language. Yeah. Now, because I have to work with translators, I realize so much is lost in translation. I mean, I've been working uh, in dual languages for nearly 30 years now in Asia. So I'm, I think I, I've realized what actually matters. You have to get to the crux. And you have to throw out a lot of professional language because particularly for parents, it doesn't necessarily have meaning. Hmm. And you've got to really simplify the message, but for not making it, it's not that it makes it simple. You've got to make it true, but not with lots of highfalutin concepts that might be Western specific or mean that you need to already be qualified right. as a psychologist and occupational therapist, because then we're not able to reach the people who need the, the support. And mostly it's the parents who are with these children 24-7. Mm-hmm. Those are who we really want to reach. Yeah, very true. I mean, it's easy to hide behind the terminology and the jargon, isn't it? Because that's kind of the bubble any professional lives in, right? And or the default position to fall into, isn't it? <laughs> what makes us professionals. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It happens in every industry, but it's a challenge exactly. isn't it, to step exactly. outside of that. Okay, I mean, that's fascinating. Can you give us an example? I mean, so obviously people in your industry will be familiar with your work. For those outside, what kind of cases can you share with us where you know you've provided this content it's had some kind of impact well i can share you i mean a very simple example which actually started face to face but um this is a a mother i've known for quite a while and she was one of the mothers that we had given us uh, permission to film and we went round to film her with her little boy and she has a little boy uh, well not so little now he's about oh he was nine at this time when I went round to film him at his house, um, he has autism and cerebral palsy. Mm. And he has lots of um, uh, a sort of unstable posture. So he wobbles when he walks, he flaps his hands, he doesn't make eye contact. Um, when I went round to see him, I'm trained in something called sensory integration, which is about how children learn through their senses and understanding through children's behavior, what what it's telling you about how their sensory systems are working. Now, when we talk about senses, we often tend to think about, you know, sight, touch, smell, taste, mm-hmm. um, uh, hearing. But we forget the two hidden ones, which are something called vestibular, which is about being balanced and feeling where your body is in space, and proprioception, which is your body awareness. Mm. And this little boy, when I was watching him, it became so clear that he had no concept of where his body was in space. He rocked all the time because he was seeking what we call vestibular input. He was trying to strengthen his core so that he could feel himself physically in space. And I just said to the mum, I just suggested to her through a translator, because she doesn't speak English, um, I want to show you some very simple exercises you need to do with your son. And um, 
the the staff filmed me with him and I said, just take this away and work on it as a team. So they filmed me making all these suggestions. I came back a year later and you can actually find on my YouTube channel um, the mother telling me what had happened. And she mm. came up and said, it's amazing. My son has been transformed by the exercises I implemented. And she wow. did these, she followed them to the T. She's a wonderful woman. Um, and she took everything on board. And within six months, this little boy, so he was nine when I saw him, had become more engaged. And what had most meaning for her was that she'd managed to get him toilet trained. Mm. Now, he's nine years old. Mm. She'd never been able to take him out because he wasn't aware of his body and wasn't yeah. toilet trained. And so this was a big embarrassment for her. So she stayed at home. And just these very simple exercises, the impact of a bit of specialist advice, realizing what the child is communicating through their movements and mother taking on board, following it. Um, had and, and this was what had such meaning for her. I can now take my child out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And the child becomes less for her a burden. And I suppose it's the, the, the small cog that turns bigger cogs later on in life that he maybe gets a little bit more, or well, both of them get a bit more independence in their life. But it's so fascinating. That's such a, I mean, it really is a quick win, isn't it? That you've, you've given to that family. You haven't prescribed 12 months of therapy to them. You've given them some very simple instructions to follow, which have had a big impact. So, I guess that raises a question for me is why isn't that more common when it comes to therapy or, or is it that I just don't understand it better? Um, I think it's, I think that's how therapists work. I think particularly for children in rural India, it's accessing that level of expertise. Yeah. I mean, I, I work in a clinic here in Singapore and the therapists are superb and they would do a lot of this practical thing, but it's time consuming. It's expensive. It's for parents to know that there are people who have that expertise. Mm -hmm. um, and I always say nobody teaches you how to bring up your children, even parents um, of children who have no challenges. We're doing it on a wing in a prayer. Yeah, we've, we've forgotten what it was like to be children and nobody shows us how to do it. So we're always just sort of making our way up, uh, making our making up our way as we go along. Exactly. Um, but it's even more challenging if your child learns differently. Hmm. And then you're so stressed because often parents feel it's their own failure um, and they don't know what to do. So it's this sort of self-perpetuating cycle. You haven't got the knowledge. Your child isn't doing as you expect. You're getting upset. They're getting upset. Life becomes difficult and it doesn't need to be because there is expertise out there. How much is that difficulty magnified in a place like rural India? I, I'm wondering, I mean, I don't understand. I mean, I've been to India, spent a lot of time in India, but I've never s looked at it through the, the context of s special needs. I mean, it, it's all very well in developed economies where we have a, you know, there's much more access to understanding and people understand that this child is like this because of special needs. In a place like rural India, are they as open-minded when it comes to the children and, and also i mean how do they react to this you know effectively a white woman coming from outside telling them what to do are they open to that or i mean how does all that work um well to answer the last question first it's very much a partnership we partner with the lady who runs the school who is an um, indian mother from the local community um, whose child has a special need mm -hmm. so um you know, I'm always, my, you don't want to be the, the Western expert. Mm. And it's about a partnership. I have an expertise, but I might make assumptions that um, aren't actually what is meaningful for the, the families and the clinicians that I work with. So it always has to be, I'm reading a book at the moment about sustainable impact. It always has to be about humility. You know, I might have expertise, but what is it you need and how between us can we solve this problem? Because you've got the experience of the child as the mother or the clinician on the ground in rural India. You've got the context. I've got some ideas. Let's put them together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how we always want to see it, that it's about partnership um, and it's all about building relationships. So this is one of the challenges uh, with technology is that you can't build the relationships in quite the same way. 
Yeah, is it, that's the challenge, isn't it, as well? I mean, we're coming up to talking about you being part of Impact Tech in a minute. The challenge with technology is there is easily an ivory tower in which we exist. And I suppose that breeds a little bit of arrogance, isn't it? That I can take a technology solution and I can go out into the field and it can fix all these problems. Whereas that can never replace, you know, 30 years of clinical experience or the kind of knowledge that you've built up and the ability to work with people as well on a, on a people to people basis, rather than looking at them as quote unquote users or end users in any sort of form. Yeah. So yeah. I, I'm, now I want to sort of bring this around to technology and you know how you took that step i know you said that you realized that to take this to the next level you needed to you know use some kind of technology to dissipate your knowledge into places like india can you tell us a little bit about that journey was it a natural next step for you to say right i need to go to a technology accelerator because that wouldn't have been a, a you know uh, an obvious choice in the, the world of a clinician right so how did that all happen for you how did it happen? I think it was just, I suppose because I'm a people person, I'm always networking, wanting to find out, talking to people about ideas. Um, and it was actually uh, somebody at the British High Commission who I'd been talking to about business development who happened to know what Kinneray was doing. And I explained my business model and how this is what I wanted to do. Um, and he introduced me to them and I went and had a conversation and we both shared what we were looking at doing and it seemed to be a natural match because mm. I don't come from the world of business, I don't come from the world of technology, but I need them both if I'm going to build um, a sustainable um, model of support for these children. I mean, just going back to one of your earlier questions, I'd also just like to say, I don't think anything will ever replace the personal relationship mm. with a clinical professional. I think what my company really seeks to do is build a bridge between something and nothing. Um, and ideally, eventually it will work itself out and won't be needed because there'll be enough people who have the skills in the places that need them. I think always we want to come back, particularly when you're working with children. We don't want a robot teaching them how to walk or things. We want people who love them, touch them, engage with them in a spontaneous and warm way. But until there's enough knowledge out there, technology is a wonderful avatar for um, getting some information out there mm. that is good enough to give um, children sort of at the bottom of the pyramid at the moment um, and and the people and the adults who work with them support knowledge and expertise yeah technology will never replace that human touch but it can do all the heavy lifting that makes the people that work in that field focus really on what they're good at rather than the other stuff right i mean that's th that's how technology really should work so did you yep. go to impact tech with that vision i know you talk about building it to a stage where you know, that everybody has access to this in, in these places like rural India. Did you go to the accelerator and say, right, this is my vision, this is my product, this is my business model? I mean, to what extent were you, you know, you had all the the numbers and the figures worked out, or did you really just go with an idea? Oh, no, no, I'd already started. I knew what I wanted to do. I'd started my platform. I'd started my training courses. I had some figures, tenuous figures. What I didn't have was confidence um, as to how I would do it. Mm -hmm. I didn't have some of the language, and I certainly didn't have access to potential um, tech funders. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you already had a model that worked. You went to the accelerator really to put a bit of the architecture in that so you could also get access to people who could help you grow that as well. Now, uh, this is one thing that's always fascinated me, Caroline, is that you, you mentioned being involved in social technology and people mentioned words like social entrepreneurship and so on. Is there ever a conflict of interest there that, you know, you're talking about funders? So naturally, any kind of investor wants an exit in a business. So they want to put money into a business, they want to see that business grow, and they want to take their money out, they want to make a profit. A little bit different in your space, but I'm just curious to know about that, you know, how that's managed, because, 
your business is a little bit different, right? I mean, you're not in it just to make a profit. There's, there's a much bigger vision involved here. So how does that all sort of sit with you when you know, you're talking to funders and talking to investors? Well, I mean, I'm very aware that I am more of an impact social entrepreneur than a profit social entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the new movement into um, beneficiary uh, corporations is, is the way that I'm heading a benefit corporation, sorry, that's mm-hmm. the word. Um, and I realize that's quite new because actually, um, because I'm looking at the bottom of the pyramid, you, I have a slight issue with making money from people who are suffering. Right. You know, I think that's any social entrepreneur's sh- struggle. And that's why I'm a therapist, not a, um, <laughs> in banking or business. Um, because I, I, I'm more interested in, in impact and people. But I'm also aware that if you don't look at any um, business in a sustainable way, which is what business people do, you're not going to be able to have impact. So it has to make profit to grow. And this is something you know I've been having to learn and change some of my assumptions. Um, also, because um, you know, I know what my hourly rate is as an individual, Um, And I see one child in that. If you've developed something that is meaningful and good online, um, that millions of people can be accessing, you are highly scalable. Mm. And if we get it right, it has the potential to be highly profitable. That's not what interests me particularly, but I know it's what interests investors. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, and, and the whole field of artificial intelligence, again, we're at the cusp of some of this. And about six years ago, I developed an assessment where I said something, I want to wire my brain. And at that point, I put it up in a cupboard because I couldn't afford to get it wired um, in a computer. We're in a different space now, six years on, and I'm trying to get funding now to get that wired. So what do you mean, wire your brain? Um, well, the idea that... So, so when a child comes in and sees me, there's lots of neurons in my brain with right. all, all my knowledge that are a firing basically an algorithm in ai is a wired brain isn't it this mm-hmm. whole deep mind thing that google is investing hugely in is getting neuroscientists who understand brain pathways and um technological people together and creating artificial intelligence so i want to create something that's at least a, a fair simulation of what happens in my neuron wiring in an algorithm that somebody can do on a handheld device. Um, well, and that's value. It has immense value. Mm. Well, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of issues going on here. Let, let's sort of backtrack. We'll, we'll come to the artificial intelligence bit in a minute. Just, and you mentioned, for example, about making a profit from what you're doing or what the drivers are. I, I, mean, I suppose for people from the outside looking at that space, they may be familiar with, I suppose, the work of people like, um, Mohammed Yunus from Grameen Bank. I mean, he won the Nobel Prize for that. That sort of, when people really, I know a lot of people in the space have been talking about it before, but outside people really started talking about things like social entrepreneurship. And that certainly gave, you know, much more of a, a bigger stage to things like microfinance as as a movement. And people thought, actually, you could make money out of that. Now, I'm just going back to that Mohammed Yunus story because I think it's interesting with what you're doing. I remember seeing him talk about this and saying that, you know, rather than trying to go out and change the world, all he did was go out and try and fix one person's problem. In his case, I think he went out and found somebody who needed to borrow money, some woman who was making a basket or weaving a basket and lent her the money and and so on. And that's where it started with yourself. How do you go about that? Because you have this vision, which you're working towards. Are you, always conscious of that vision or you just focused on the day to day and just going out and right, I'm going to work with this teacher or these people here. How does that work for you? Because what you do, I think would be really interesting advice for people following in your footsteps about how to do that. I mean, do you go out with the big change the world vision or you just focused on what's happening day to day? I think they, I don't know if they're separate. I think they feed in Hmm. to one another. So I mean, I mean, I do individual face-to-face work with children, which inspires me to think, oh, yeah, you know, this works, this is a good model, you know, which always feeds into what I then 
um, developing my trainings that go online. I also have um, a radio station, a YouTube channel. I do a lot of free social media that is changing attitudes to how we understand how children learn. I have a, I think I sent you a podcast as well, mm -hmm. where I interview people who are interested. So I don't, for me, they're not separate. I love working with the individual child because it's so rewarding and I love that element of relationship. But also at the back of my mind, I have these children, particularly in, in India, but also in the rest of the world. I've just been in South Africa. And you think, you know, they're always in the back of my mind as well. I, I don't tend to separate. I think I'm, I'm a dreamer in some ways. You say I'm a maverick. I'm always thinking of how you can make a difference. You can keep inspiring people, whether it's training other people up in, my, in the models that I've developed, whether it's working with the individual child, whether it's doing a radio podcast with somebody who's doing interesting work in South Africa or India that will inspire people. I, 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 I do, I think all of them, I hold them at the same time, which is probably just, I mean, it's the way my mind works. I'm, I'm all over the place in some ways, but it all holds together as a right. theme. There's a method to it all, right? There's a method in my madness. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> well I mean, that's fascinating. I, I, I mean, the reason I ask is because there, there must be, and what I know, because I've, I've met them, a lot of people starting out on the journey. And whether they're people, you know, they're graduates who've just sort of left university and thinking about what they're going to do. And, you know, maybe they hear your story and think, actually, I want to head in that kind of direction. Maybe they don't want to do exactly what you've done, but elements of what you shared will inspire them to follow that path and realize that it's a, it's a valid path as well. And I think, you know, what the interesting thing about that is there's always a lot of doubt maybe criticism that does pop up in that journey as well because it's not like okay right go and work for goldman sachs for 10 years nobody's going to complain about that right or become a doctor and you know these are very safe career paths but when you choose something else like what you're doing i imagine it opens people especially you know when they're starting out and they're less confident in themselves to doubt and criticism if you were to see somebody younger or even a younger Caroline starting out, you know, just graduated, just going, you know, thinking about going to, you know, going through the clinical training and so on. What would you advise if they wanted to get into the space that you're getting into, if they wanted to create impact with technology, where do they start? Do they 20, 30 years as, a, you know, training in that space and then go and start their business or is, you know, what options are there? I know it's case by case and I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> um, I think particularly um, in, the, in the field that I'm in, you do need some expertise. I mean, I'm aware even in face-to-face -face work that sometimes people come straight out of college and they go immediately into private practice, um, often because there's no option in this part of the world. But I know when I was in the UK, you were meant to do at least five years supervised clinical practice in either a hospital or social services before you were allowed to set up private practice. Mm -hmm. And I would always, I think to be a, it's, it's tough being a clinician. And when you're newly qualified, you've got all the ideas, but you haven't tested and tried them and, you know, had your bumps and got com as much conviction and you need to have conviction in what you do and what you believe in to be able to sustain mm. it on your own in whatever, whether you're a private practitioner or a social enterprise doing what I'm doing. So I would always encourage particularly new practitioners in my kind of field and get some experience um, so that when you're challenged, you've got that to fall back on. Mm. Um, and also I think I believe you know, the, the children and the com families and communities that we ser serve um, and work with deserve the best. Mm -hmm. And you become the best by studying under some of the best people um, and, and ha being supervised and being supported and learning the most you can before you're ready to start. I don't think it has to be 30 years, but I think minimum of two, maybe five of good practice in lots of different experiences you might decide to do something like I did in my early 20s, um, voluntary service overseas. I mm. was a UK volunteer, and that was transformative. I think that probably sowed the seeds for what I do now. Mm. 
So it doesn't have to be in an established hospital, but somewhere where you get good experience as part of a community. A really hands-on experience as well, outside your comfort zone. I mean, the VSR is a fantastic program, isn't it? I don't know if it exists in every country, but just that ability to get out and outside of the traditional establishment and you know into the field and, and work, doing that kind of work is just great experience, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And you're constantly challenged, particularly if you're working in a country and a culture that's not your own, to think differently and think from other people's perspectives. And I think that's invaluable if you're going to deliver um, some kind of social enterprise that mm. has meaning and is not paternalistic, but is about building partnerships with people who 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 you want to work with i don't want to say who necessarily need you because i think it's a mutual need in some ways yeah yeah caroline it's been fascinating talking to you and i really appreciate you coming on and sharing just a, a part of your journey with us today and i know there's a lot more to come as you grow and as you said yourself it's a new chapter really and you're constantly reinventing yourself even even though the the thread that carries through your through your career and your life is one of helping people, empowering people, teaching people, you know, you're always, I think the inspiring part about what you're doing is you're, you know, despite building up this professional experience, you're willing to challenge yourself and step outside of that. And I imagine nine out of 10 people in that space wouldn't have the guts to do that. So the fact that you've done it being a maverick, bit of a dreamer as well, I think it's been fasc fascinating. It's inspiring for people who want to do that kind of thing as well. So before you go, I want to ask you for some further links so people can find out more about you because I'm sure people are going to want to check out your story. So where can people go online and discover you? Well, um, I have a, uh, my website is www.createcat, that's C-R-E-A-T-E-C-A-T-T. -T -T. Mm -hmm. dot com hope i've spelt it right um and on that you'll see the links to our youtube channel you can find out about our india work um the little uh, there's a little spreaker signal which is a podcast so you can hear us chatting to lots of different people um facebook page um and and the twitter's on there so we're, we're very um active on social media building community or you can um, email me. I'm based in Singapore, but I work in India, and I also have a UK partner as well. Um, so you can always contact me on the website if you're interested to find out more. Um, if you happen to be in the Asian region, come to some of our workshops. We're just about to launch. It will be out probably in the next couple of months. We made a little documentary about our work in India, and that will mm. go on to Facebook and Twitter. So um, you know, if you want to see that to find out more, um, that will be coming up soon. It's called Mothers of Light, and it's about the um, the mothers at Deep Tea Special School and how their lives have been transformed by the school and our partnership work. So we're always doing things, and I'm I, I can easily be found with my unusual surname as well. <laughs> Fantastic. That's Caroline Essam, everybody. Real pleasure having you on the show and wishing you all the best as well. So please do come back on at some point in the future. I know you said, for example, you're publishing this documentary. There's a lot going on in your world and it's a journey which is unfolding constantly. So it would be great to get an update at some point in the future and share with us where you are in that journey. Karen, thanks so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.